song talks about a victory and God wins. We've read the end of the book. We're reading the end of the book and we know he wins. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing out this victory song. And you guys, as we're singing, lift up your voices in prayer, okay? Not just songs and words, but turn these words into a prayer.
stand or be seated however the Lord's leading you.
but we can also be having clogged ears. And so waken us today through your spirit. Fall upon us, please. Continue to move in this house of worship and praise. May you be glorified.
praises of your people to pull down strongholds, God. You are the victory. You are the hope. And we stand on the promises of that firm foundation that you say you will never leave us or forsake us. So as we lift our hands and our voices and our hearts and our cries to you, God, we do so in exaltation for all the mighty things that you have accomplished and are accomplishing. Thank you, Jesus.
God, we stand just in awe of who you are. God, I thank you for technical difficulties because when you come through those technical difficulties, as you always do, you're exalted. You foil the plans of the enemy. You are the victor. You rule and reign in each of our lives. You rule and reign in this place, God, and we praise you. Our melody is that battle cry. Your blood is so powerful, God. We pray just a mighty, mighty um, dunamis, dunamis power, God, on your word today as Pastor Martin brings it forth. And we anticipate, we look forward to, we expect to see something glorious, Lord, for your people, for this congregation today in your word. So the, through the rest of this service, continue to be exalted. Oh God, most high, in your name, amen. Please go say hi to someone. Let's pray. Before we pray, before we pray, let's go, let's not go. As you guys know, I don't typically um, put titles on the sermons. If I were to entitle this morning's sermon, it would either be super crazy ambitious with what little time we have, or connect the dots. And so this is why I don't typically title our messages. <laughs> so keep me in prayer. Uh, if you're taking notes, have your pen ready. If not, we'll have these notes posted with the sermon later. So um, I covet your prayers this morning in covering the ground we need to cover in the time that we have to cover it in. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as I uh, joke just a little bit about uh, how I would entitle this sermon with my eyes, um, it, it was a joke. The reality, Lord, is that this is your word, and that your word is significant. Your word is eternal. Your word is enduring, and it is your word which changes hearts and lives. And so open our eyes this morning to see wonderful things in your word have an impact on our lives, not just our relationship with you, but how we continue to live in that relationship. So be with us as we go through your word. We ask you to anoint it by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're continuing in Revelation chapter 19, part two. I want to clarify something that I said last week. Last week in regards to, is this me, why this is coming in or now? Last week when I spoke in regards to the church being sheltered from the wrath of God, and I mentioned how the temple is closed when God's wrath is building and it's full of smoke and thunderings and noise and the temple is closed. And I said this is because the church doesn't see the wrath of God, which is accurate. However, what we do need to be aware of is the church sees the effects of the wrath of God. You see, we're not sheltered from the judgment that's poured out on the wicked. We're not sheltered from the effects of that, which we're going to see here in chapter 19. What the church is sheltered from is seeing the Father himself as his wrath is fully kindled in his complete wrathful state. We're sheltered from that. That's a picture we will not carry throughout eternity, and I'm thankful for that because the Bible tells us that God is love, right? God is also just. And God is also justice and judgment and wrath. But for those who love him, we will not see him at his angriest. Thank you, Jesus, literally. Okay, so that's a clarification from last week. Picking up here in Revelation 19, we're going to pick up in verse 9. And then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So as we'd mentioned before, there are seven blesseds or beatitudes in the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of his prophecy and keep these things which are written in it, for the time is near. Chapter 4, verse 13, then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. 
Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And then the fourth one, which is here in 19 verse 9. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. We see it three more times. In chapter 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has a part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. We see it in 22, verse 7. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecies of this book. And finally, we see it in 22, verse 14. Whew. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Now I find it awesome that the final blessing in the Bible, blessed are those who do his commandments. And what is it that Jesus told us that we have repeated countless times? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. We try to make things way more complex than what they are. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. As Christians, we are to keep his commandments, amen? Pretty simple, pretty basic. All right, so we're going to uh, dissect this verse a little bit. We've discussed before about how punctuation is very important. Content is very important. And language is very important. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we're going to discuss this a little bit. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So who are called? Let's look at the parties involved. We've discussed briefly the Canaan uh, Judean wedding, wedding festival. And this wedding has many participants. There's the father of the bridegroom. There's the bridegroom, there's the bride, there are the friends of the bridegroom, and then there are those who are called as guests. So in this passage, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm going to ask you, who is it in your mind that would be called to the marriage supper? Would the groom be called? No, it's his wedding. Would the father be called? No, he made the arrangements. Would the bride be called? No, it's her wedding. So who's going to be called? The guests are going to be called. The best man's going to be called. The wedding party's going to be called. This is not a church passage. The church, the bride of Christ, is already there with the groom and the father in the father's house. This is not a church passage. So let's look at Matthew chapter 22. We're going to look at verses 1 through 14. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. Matthew 22, verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. So right here we have three participants. The king who arranged a marriage, a bride for his son. Okay, so those three participants are already in play. And the king sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. So we want to look a little bit at the process of those who were invited to come. Typically today, we send out an invitation. Hey, we got a wedding on the 21st. Here's your invitation. RSVP if you're coming. And so we, we, RSVP if we're coming. <laughs> My wife takes care of these details. So we RSVP, okay, we're coming. That's what we think about. In the Jewish ceremony, in this wedding ceremony, or in the king's celebration, that's not how it went. These ceremonies, these feasts, were prepared years, at least a year, sometimes many, many years in advance. The invited parties have been invited for a long time. A long time. They have already RSVP'd. They have already committed to be there. When the time comes, the king or the father, he doesn't send out an invite saying, are you coming? He sends out a notification that says, 
the feast that you agreed to come to, it's now time. I need to prepare the food. I need to prepare the place. This is the date. You have already agreed to come. Now come. This is the day that my son is getting married. This is the day we have the feast. So when it says they weren't willing to come, this is people who already had the invitation and already said they wanted to be there. But the time had come, and they said no. So again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen, fat and calf are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Let's pause there. Why were they not worthy? Because they refused to accept the invitation. You see, we talk so much about Christians and preaching the gospel. And I just mentioned earlier, we complicate things far more than they need to be. They weren't worthy because they had been invited and they declined the invitation. We are only worthy as children of God because Christ is worthy and we are clothed in his righteousness. Amen? Verse 9, Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Now remember, the wedding garments were provided by the king, the father of the groom. You didn't go to Walmart, you didn't go to Tuxies, you didn't go someplace and buy your fancy clothes and show up at the king's house because none of that's going to cut the mustard. The king provided the garments that he wanted his guests to wear. So this man shows up in his own clothes. And what did we talk about a couple of weeks ago, maybe even last week? Our own clothes, our own works, our own righteousness is like what? Filthy rags. So the man is standing there in his filthy rags as we talked about, of used menstrual cloths at the king's wedding for his son. This is not a pleasant picture. Hmm. Then the king said to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Let's dive into this whole one a little bit. This man was obviously called. He obviously accepted the invitation. He showed up at the feast. Why wasn't he chosen? Because he chose it to do it his own way. He refused. He accepted the invitation, but he said, I will only come my way. How many people have said, God's going to have a lot of explaining to do when I, when I meet him? This is not going to work out in your favor if you've ever thought that. There is but one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved, and that is to believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything else, period, everything else, you wind up standing in the presence of a holy God in your own righteousness, in your own garments. Bad place to be. So that's a picture of the kingdom of God, and Jesus himself said that. The kingdom of God is like, and he gives us the wedding demonstration. So, the bridegroom at this wedding celebration, uh, we know very clearly that's Jesus Christ. Is there any question on that? There would be no debate. In Matthew 9, 14 and 15, it says, The disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but you and your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with him? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. You see, many people have tried to say the bridegroom is various different things. Um, Jesus himself here refers to himself as the bridegroom. So that's pretty self-explanatory. 
2 Corinthians 11, 2, Paul writes, For I am jealous of, for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Which leads us to the bride. Who's the bride? The bride is the church. You can also find that in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23 through 32. The church has a unique position, a very unique position at the wedding festival. John 17, I'll let you turn there if you would, please. John 17, verse 20. We'll look at this in a little, slightly different light today. John chapter 17, verse 20. John 17, 20. This is Christ speaking here. It says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be as one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus is praying for the church. He's praying for his immediately dis immediate disciples who have believed him and for everyone who will believe in their testimony that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you believe in the testimony that the original apostles gave? Do you believe in your Bible? Do we believe in their testimony? Then we are right here at 17. Jesus is praying for us. That they all may be, in, may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Now we know that Jesus and the Father are one, right? They are two different personalities, but they are joined in essence. They are one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are one. Jesus is praying that we, his bride, his church, will be one with him as he is one with the Father. And that the glory which you gave me I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Very important. And that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Folks, the church has a very unique position in God's kingdom. We are not better than Israel. We do not replace Israel. We are different. We are a different group. We are the bride of Christ. And that makes us unique. Amen? So who are the friends of the bridegroom? Let's look at John chapter 3, verse 28. John chapter 3, verse 28. This is John the Baptist speaking. And he's talking to religious rulers who have been sent to question who he is. He says, you yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. John the Baptist himself realized he was not of the bride. He was a friend of the bridegroom. John the Baptist is in a different group than the church. Is John the Baptist saved? You better believe it. Absolutely. Is John the Baptist in the church? No, he's not. John says, he must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Jesus said these words in Luke chapter 16, verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Jesus himself sets a delineator at John, the apostle. In Matthew, I'll let you turn to Matthew chapter 11. 
We're going to read verses 16, excuse me, 7 through 15. Tongue tied. Matthew 11, beginning in verse 7. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitude concerning John, What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, and I say to you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. That is a pretty big statement right there. Jesus Christ said, of those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he didn't stop there. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. If you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You see, one of the responsibilities of the bridegroom was to handle the preparations of the wedding. He made sure the garments and the implements and the makeup and the, the wedding things got to the bridal party. He took care of the arrangements. The bridegroom prepared the way for the bride. Excuse me. The best man, the friend of the bridegroom, prepared the way for the bridegroom. As we talked before, when the bridegroom came with his party and a cry is heard, behold, the bridegroom cometh. It's the best man that's proclaiming that. That's one of his jobs. This is what John the Baptist was doing. Behold the bridegroom. When he baptized Jesus or pointed him out, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This was John's job. And John understood that. So John is what we could consider the best man. He's a friend of the bridegroom at this guest in the wedding party. Some other guests. Let's look at Luke chapter 14. Beginning in verse 16. Luke 14, verse 16. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask you to let me be excused. Still another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came, reported all these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it's done as you commanded. And still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. That's going to be very important later. Compel them. Go get them. Go grab them. Go drag them in. Bring them in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Now remember, they were invited from a long time previous. They knew all about it. The date had been set. They just chose to not participate. Hmm. In Luke 13, 23 through 26, one of them asked Jesus, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us, and he will answer and say to you, I do not know you or where you're from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. You remember the guest that was in his own clothes? He was in the presence of the dancing and singing and the celebration of the Lord 
but he didn't know him. He knew who the bridegroom was. He knew who the father was. He knew where the party was. He knew all about it, but he did not know them. You see, we can know all about Jesus. We can talk about God, but do we know him? And more importantly, does he know us? He will not violate our free will. He will not come in unless we open the door and invite him. Verse 27, but he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you're from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first and there are first who will be last. So in the bridal party, in the, the feast, in the wedding ceremony, the bride is implied. We know she's there, right? The groom is there. We know he's there. The guests in these parables were those who were called to this celebration, but the bridegroom and the bride are already there when the guests arrive. So they're not the church. Does that make sense? Follow along here? The guests, and I'm just going to make a big sweep through this. The guests include the Old Testament saints. you find that in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. You'll also find it in Isaiah 26, verse 19. These Old Testament saints will have a resurrected body. There's no point in going to the feast if they can't eat. <laughs> Does it make sense? Okay, the Old Testament saints will be guests at the wedding ceremony of the Lamb in resurrected bodies. The two witnesses will be there. We've had much discussion about them. The two witnesses who testified who preached Christ in front of the temple, who were killed and then taken to heaven, they're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen? Elijah, who is to come, is going to be at the wedding ceremony of the Lamb. The 144,000 Jewish witnesses of the 12 tribes of Israel, they're going to be at the marriage supper. The completed number of the tribulation martyred saints that we see first in Revelation chapter 6, they're going to be there, and they're going to have resurrected bodies. The Jewish remnant mortals who accept Christ as their Messiah and ask him to come and save them, they will be there. And incidentally, this group are the five wise virgins that we see in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. Those, that parable is not about the church because the groom, or excuse me, these virgins are the bride's party, not the bride, right? So the five wise virgins represent mortal Jewish Israeli remnants who cry out to the Lord. Hmm. Also, Gentiles who survive the tribulation don't take the mark of the beast and survive the sheep and goat judgment in Matthew 25, they will be there. And I would imply the righteous angels of God will also be there. You want to know what won't be there? Anything that offends. Hmm. So, we've kind of went through, discussed who the groom, the bride, the father, the guests, what about this one man who shows up in his own clothing? We know what that represents. Is that ever resolved? Well, here's a spoiler. You're going to see this guy in chapter 20. You'll, you'll see him get resolved in chapter 20. That's all I'm going to spoil about chapter 20. I'm not going to promise because I probably will do something else in a minute. But Okay. This feast is referenced in the Old Testament as well as the New. I'm going to... Yes. In Isaiah 25, verse 6, that was perfect. That was awesome. Thank you, Lord. Isaiah 25, beginning of verse 6. And in this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines of the leaves, of fat, things of full of marrow, 
the well-refined wines of the leaves. He will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. A couple of things to note here. In this mountain, what mountain is he talking about? Mount Zion, which is located where? In Israel. Jerusalem. This is very location-centric. In this mountain, the Lord will make a, of hosts will make for how many people? All people. All people a feast of choice pieces. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. What is this covering and what is this veil? It's a separation between God and man that exists because of sin. See, that veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, which to be torn from top to bottom, God had to do that. And number one, it wasn't a sheet. It wasn't a bed sheet that a man could tear. It was like 18 inches thick, woven, super heavy fabric. This was God's business. God split that veil of that temple from top to bottom, signifying that by the blood of his son, that division, that separation between God and man is gone as long as we're clothed in his son's righteousness and in his son's blood as a sacrificial lamb. Amen? Continuing Isaiah 25, he will swallow up death forever. And the, Has this ever happened? No? So is this a future event? Okay. Just, just checking. And the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Turn to Luke chapter 22, please. And again, just to keep us focused on what we're talking about, the wedding feast, the great feast that will take place here on the earth. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse, verse 14. When the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Very familiar story. We're talking about the Last Supper. Very intimate, close gathering with Jesus and his disciples. So he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And then he said to them, with fervent desire... I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus Christ, God eternal, who paid the price for our sins, became a man, lived, died, was buried and resurrected. God eternal, the creator of everything that is, by the power of his voice has said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until you meet me in the kingdom and I drink with you. Does that mean anything to anybody but me? Man, that is impactful. God is waiting for a specific day, for a specific time he can sit down and fellowship with those that he purchased with his own blood. Is that awesome or what? Wow. Uh, I lost my place. Verse 17. Then he took the cup, take, divide it amongst yourselves, I will, so forth. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, I find it quite amazing that he's commanded us to do this in remembrance of him while he waits for the day that he can do it with us in person. Mm. So this feast, the wedding feast, takes place on the earth in Jerusalem after Christ returns to the earth to judge it, which is the completion of God's wrath. And after the gathering... There's two gatherings, if you recall, in Revelation chapter 14. There's a gathering of the elect, the saints, and there's a gathering of the condemned. And those are gathered.
so that there can be a sheep and goat judgment. We talked about that in Matthew 14. Does this ring familiar? Yeah, okay. It also takes place after the sheep and goat judgments in Matthew 25. Um, Matthew 13, Jesus gives us a clue how that works. In Matthew 13, beginning in verse 37, He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Remember as we discussed in Revelation 14, both of these reapings, these harvests in Revelation chapter 14 are carried out by angels. There is a gathering of the elect to Jesus, and there is a gathering of the condemned to stand before Jesus. So as Jesus predicted here, or prophesied in 13, his angels, son of man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. And he will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Something we need to get clear in our mind and keep clear in our mind is that at the wedding feast of the Lamb, there will be nothing, nothing, zero things in his kingdom that offend. So what offends? Sin. There will be no sin in his kingdom. Satan offends. He won't be there. Again, slight spoilers from next chapter. Demons, they will not be there. Fallen angels, they will not be there. Rebellion will not be there. There will be nothing on this world to offend him or that offends him when his millennial kingdom is set up. Not to say there won't have some things come along in between then and where we go later, but at the start of his millennial kingdom, the angels have gathered up all things that offend, and Jesus has come and sat in judgment, and those are done. The beginning of his millennial reign is perfect. Again, not to spoil too much of Revelation 20, but the millennial reign of Christ is a unique extremely unique situation. One that has never been before and will never be again. We'll discuss that as we get closer. Wow, we're making some awesome progress. Let's get to Revelation 19, verse 10. Revelation, verse 19, 10. John is so overwhelmed, he said, I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said, see that you do not do that. That's, it's funny in the Greek, it's two staccato words. Horeme, it's very staccato. Reminds me of my, my grandpa, my, my sister and I used to tease each other, but my grandpa had certain traits. You know, grandpa was, he was an okie. Yeah, let's face it, he was an okie. Very intelligent man. He could be very articulate, or he could immediately slip back into his okie roots. And I can identify with that. All I have to do is get in an airplane and fly over the state. And I'm instant okey. Let me pick up the phone, talk to one of my kids. Hey, how are you doing? I mean, I mean, fall, instantly just falls right in. But my grandpa, if pushed to his limits, he would. Now, I don't know how he dealt with his children because they obviously were grown before I came along. But with his grandchildren, if we were being way too noisy and we have been told one too many times to be quiet, he would just say, get quiet! And an interpretation, get quiet. But when Grandpa said that, and it was usually two or three octaves lower, whatever we were doing, we knew we had pushed too far. And it's time to instantly stop. And so that's kind of what I see here in this. This angel is rebuking John quickly, fastly. He will not be, succumb to the temptation that Lucifer succumbed to. He will not be worshipped. Now, John knows you're not supposed to do this, but he was so overwhelmed at what's going on, he just did it. And he's going to end up doing it again later, so don't judge John too badly. <laughs> so the angel says, See that you do not do that. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. 
worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's very important to know. Um, a lot of churches won't teach prophecy anymore. Uh, it's not for today. It's not effective. It doesn't really suit our, our goals. The testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Amen? Hebrews 10.4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Jesus Christ, the volume of the book from Genesis to Revelation is written of Jesus Christ. Particularly when it comes to prophecy, if you have a problem, insert Jesus Christ into the middle of your problem and suddenly you will get clarity. Jesus Christ, the testimony of him, is the spirit of prophecy. Wow, amen. Moving on, more great progress. We're in verse 11, Revelation 19, 11. Now I saw heaven opened. Notice that heaven is open. This isn't just a door or a window. Imagine, if you will, now, I don't even know how to describe this, but imagine John has seen visions of looking into heaven and seeing a door open. Imagine looking up and the entire heavens open and there's no more division between heaven and earth. And in that vision, there is Jesus on a white horse and his armies are behind him and his angels are with him. And all eyes will see him. And every single person will know this is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, King of the Jews. How would you like to be one that has said there is no such thing as Jesus? How would you like to be one that said, I will not have that man rule and reign over me and it's not even possible, it's ridiculous. And the heavens open and there's one who sits on a horse and his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And now you have to deal with him. Don't be in that place. Deal with him today. While well, today is a day of salvation. Amen. So I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. Now anyone who would say that Jesus Christ is not returning in judgment and in war has to symbolize virtually this entire book of Revelation. This is pretty clear. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. He is distinctly different than the white horse that you see in Revelation 6. As we talked about when we were going through Revelation 6, this white horse is such a good imitator that a lot of people mistake him for Jesus. But he's not. He's the beast. And in fact, the very first prophecy from a prophet, we can find it in Jude 1, 14 to 15, but it was actually uttered by Enoch, the seventh from Adam. And this first prophecy says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all of their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Is there a theme? <laughs> so Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about Christ's second advent. He jumps all the way through to the last return of Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So we know that Jesus Christ ascended and he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. Amen? Till until the Father makes his enemies his footstool. What we're seeing here in Revelation 19, it's time for till. <laughs> it's time that the Father makes Jesus Christ's enemies his footstool. Hebrews 10, verses 10 through 13. Wow, I might make it today. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. Jesus Christ is waiting for the time. But folks, that time will come. Whether we believe it, whether we don't. Now, as his church, we believe it. I'm praying, even so, come Lord Jesus. Because when he comes for me, he's not coming in wrath and anger and judgment. He took that for me on the cross. He's coming to catch me up. To where he is, I may be also. So even so, Lord, come. But I got friends and people who don't know him. And so for that, I would say, Lord. Lord, I pray for the salvation. Pray for those who don't know you. Mm. Revelation 19, verse 12. Wow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And these are diadema. These are ruling crowns. These aren't Stephanos, which were on the head of the guy in chapter 6. Think of chapter 6, think of rewards like the Olympic Games. Chapter 19, diademos, kingly authoritative ruling crowns. This is Jesus Christ. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped, or better yet, splattered in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. I'd encourage you to go make a note to read Isaiah 63 verses 1 through 4 and also the entire 36th sixth chapter of Isaiah. This is Christ after he has dealt with his enemies in Basra. He's splattered in blood, and it's not his own. This isn't the blood that he shed on the cross. This is the blood of his enemies. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. You want to know where you are in Scripture? If you know Jesus Christ, here you are. The armies of heaven, now notice, they followed him. They don't come to war. We don't go to war. Jesus doesn't need us. As you read in Isaiah, he said, Behold, I have trodden the winepress of the fury of my God by myself, and there was none with me. We don't come to do battle with Jesus. We just show up to watch. We're his army, but he don't need us. <laughs> Amen? Verse 15, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. This is the second feast mentioned in Revelation chapter 19. It actually occurs first. There's two feasts in Revelation 19. There's the marriage supper of the Lamb, and this is the great feast of our God. Continuing in verse 18, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, of horses, and of those who sit on them, the flesh of all the people, free and slave, both small and great, this is quite a grisly feast. This is where Jesus himself gathers together the armies who come to make war with the saints. And he implodes them with the word of his mouth. That's what we've read. There's blood for 180 miles long, four feet thick. So he's called all the birds to come together for the supper of the great God. Whew. Verse 20, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. That's a pretty grisly feast. The only way we can... I don't know how to even put it. The only way we can survive such visions of, of horror 
is knowing what it's for. I believe God gives us the vision of the wedding supper of the Lamb first so that we can endure the vision of the great supper of God for the condemned and the damned. Because in his kingdom, as I said, there will be nothing that offends. So we're going to close now. And if you're listening, if you're here with us or listening uh, through any of the ways that we, that we go out, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, today would be a good day for salvation. So if you're listening and the Lord is calling you, coming to Christ is very simple. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if you want to be at the first feast, you need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if you don't, whether you want to or not, you'll be at the second. So with that, let's pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for, for the warnings that you give us, the preparations that you give us. But most of all, Lord, we come to you because you are love, because you care for us, because you desire that we are your children, because you desire to forgive our sin, because you desire to spend eternity with us, and you demonstrate that great love for us on the cross. That's why we come to you. That's why we come to you. But we fear for those who don't, because your word makes it very clear what the end of the situation is apart from Jesus Christ. So we pray for them now. We pray for any of our friends or loved ones who don't know you, that you'd put them on our hearts to pray for them. And if you send us to them, put your words within us again by your spirit. We just lift up the faces and the names of those who need you today. And we cry out, save Lord, save them. stand and worship again with us. I know y'all don't have the words, but as soon as you kind of get the gist of what we're singing, cry out to him. Amen. Made of his glory.
bless you guys. Stay for the meeting afterwards if you're interested in helping out.